And whose are these? Whose kids are these? whispered one elderly woman to another, sitting on a bench late at night. The last days of summer were coming to an end. The sun was setting behind the horizon. Birds were chirping, and music could be heard in the distance, possibly from a cafe. And here, on a bench under a shabby, five-story building, were sitting two elderly women, the main gossips of this block. They always smiled and said hello, but behind each other's backs, they often gossiped and said nasty things about everyone. So that's Casey Kramer. She has four kids. Did you hear that they are all from different men? Young people are so reckless nowadays, said one of them. Nah, Casey's married, and she has a child with her husband, I think. Well, I don't know for sure, of course. And then she took in three more kids when her friend died in an accident. Really? the other neighbour gasped. Yeah, she felt sorry for the kids and took them in. Her apartment is fairly big, but with four kids, it's still cramped. And the oldest one is graduating from school this year. He's going to college. Which one is hers? The youngest one. I know her friend was older than Casey. All right, be quiet, she's coming. At that moment, Casey was already close enough, and of course, she heard everything. Should I say that it's none of their business? Although, why waste time and energy on it? Casey thought, and she greeted the elderly women with a gentle smile. All her children also greeted them. They entered the building and started climbing the stairs. The first to go was Erica, the eldest daughter of the late Maya. Casey followed, holding the hand of her son Troy, who was almost four years old. He had curly black hair, an exact copy of his father. Behind them, Maya's middle son, Sam, and her youngest daughter, Julie, weaved through the stairs. Casey herself was dark-skinned, petite and beautiful. Men often looked at her, but her husband, Louis, paid no attention to it, just like he paid no attention to his wife. Casey and Maya were not just childhood friends. Their bond was more like that of sisters. Maya and Casey were the only children in their families. No brothers, no sisters. There is no one to stand up for them. Maya was older and always protected her friend, defended her, and supported her. Once, Maya saved Casey's life. Casey was pushed off a bridge by some boys, not knowing that an eleven-year-old girl couldn't swim. She had never been taught, because her parents simply didn't have time for that. They were always busy with arguing and earning money. Casey found herself in the water, and Maya jumped in without hesitation. She didn't even remember that she had just been discharged from the hospital after being bitten by a dog and needing fifteen stitches. Maya pulled Casey to the shore, but her wounds got infected, and she ended up in hospital with sepsis. She was barely saved. When Maya finished school, she moved to the city. From that point on, their communication became less frequent. They still called each other, of course, but now a different adult life had begun for Maya. There was a four-year age difference between the girls. Maya got pregnant early, while still in college. Casey supported her as best she could. It was a difficult period. Her boyfriend, David, didn't want to marry her. They constantly argued, and Maya cried a lot. But things eventually got better, and they got married. With time, Maya and David had three kids. The woman had gained a little weight after childbirth, but she was still a true beauty. David loved her, even though they argued over trivial things. That's just how they were. Casey was a frequent guest at their house. It was David who introduced her to his best friend Louis. They started dating and then got married. Casey couldn't have gotten pregnant for a long time, but nevertheless their long-awaited Troy was finally born. The day David and Maya had an accident... Casey was left to look after their children. They were on their way to choose new wallpaper for the nursery. Maya insisted on a calm beige colour, while David argued for something bright, since it was a children's room. David wanted to bring the children with them, believing that seeing the bright wallpaper would make them take his side and prevent Maya from arguing. They were from that couple that was always fighting. However, whenever Maya was upset... David would lift her in his arms 
and spin her around, helping her forget her troubles and sorrows. This terrible morning, Maya and her children had already gotten into the car when suddenly their youngest, Julie, began to cry. She has a sore throat. Let her stay home, Maya frowned. Sam, who adored his little sister, asked, May I stay home too? I don't want to go and choose wallpaper. It's boring. Maya looked questioningly at her oldest daughter. Okay, mum, I'm staying too, Erica replied. Maya smiled with gratitude, promised to return quickly, and together with her husband, drove away. At that time, their kids couldn't have imagined that it would be the last time they saw their parents. Maya and David died instantly in a car accident, just five minutes before reaching the store. The children were devastated with grief. When all three of them cried while looking at their parents' graves, Casey made the only decision that felt right to her. I'll take them. They won't go to an orphanage. What? Are you crazy? Three at once. Take the oldest at least. She can help, her husband told her. Why are you so heartless? They lost their parents. Their whole world has fallen apart. They shouldn't lose each other. And by the way, David was your best friend. They had been quarrelling for the whole week and in the end, Casey started collecting documents without her husband's clear permission. The guardianship authorities met her request and placed the children under her responsibility. Louis's apartment felt spacious when there were only three of them, but with six people, everything changed. Louis often argued with his wife and couldn't contain his irritation. Why do we have to get them all? Why didn't you listen to me? Don't I have a say in this? He would say, but Casey couldn't understand how he could be so callous. This is not up for question. Maya was like a sister to me. She saved my life. If it weren't for her, I wouldn't exist any more. All I can do now is make sure her children don't become orphans. I'll be their mother and their family. It's up to you to decide. If you don't support me in this, that's your choice, but I won't change my mind, she said, hurt that her husband didn't share her feelings. Since then, their relationship has had cracks, although it wasn't perfect before. While Maya and David always fought and then resolved their issues, Casey and Louis were more silent in their family life. Sometimes the woman felt like they were strangers who were initially close but had long cooled off towards each other. They had no interest in each other's affairs, and in fact, they each lived their own lives. Louis always said that he didn't want to work for the man. He would occasionally make deals, buying goods low and selling them high. Over time, he started renting a truck and taking on different orders. Louis even had his own office, a small room, where he disappeared for days and nights recently. He claimed to be strategizing for a new business, but in reality, his ideas either didn't generate any income or required significant investments. And to Casey's upset, he often took money from the family budget. Casey received a good allowance for the three children, and the family lived off it. Initially, Louis was against having Maya's children in the house, but only until they received their first payment. This is a gold mine, he rejoiced. Casey shook her head and said, It's money for the children. However, Louis demanded money from Casey almost every month. So, a year went by. At first, Erica, the eldest of Maya's daughters, was hostile towards Casey, thinking she was trying to replace her mother. However, she eventually realized that wasn't the case and started treating Casey as a friend, sharing her problems and worries. They even went to a women's doctor together for a checkup. At the age of 16, Erica already had a boyfriend whom Casey tried to treat as Maya would do. The woman accepted him as a member of the family, joked with him, and served him tea and food. Louis started coming home less frequently, often staying late at work. Casey devoted herself entirely to the children. However, the money was not enough to provide everything she wanted for them, so she began looking for a part-time job. One day, an elderly neighbour, Mrs Lancaster, who occasionally helped Casey with the children, suggested, Why don't you try working as a wife for an hour? What do you mean? Casey was confused. My daughter-in-law does that. 
You work for a firm and follow instructions on how to behave, what you should do, and what you shouldn't do. You take orders like cleaning someone's apartment before their parents' arrival. It's mostly ordered by wealthy young people who have a lot of money but not enough sense. Some rich people hire cleaners once a week to tidy up their mess. The pay is good. Sometimes there are other tasks like babysitting. You would be great at it. Just a few hours away from home, and you come back with money. The firm takes a cut, of course, but you get around seventy percent. The only thing is that the work is different, and your behaviour will be evaluated. There's a rating system where everyone can see how much you've worked and what feedback you've received. If you're rude, you'll get bad ratings, just like in school. But I know you, Casey. You're a hard-working woman. You'll do great. After hearing her neighbor's suggestion, Casey considered it. It wouldn't be a bad idea to work that way, but she'd have to try not to let Louis find out. Then she could give all the money to the children and buy them something they wanted. Erica had been wanting a new phone for a while, as she had been using a basic button phone for a year and couldn't even communicate with her peers properly in chat rooms. Casey went to the address given by her neighbor. Upon learning that Casey was raising her friend's three children, she was accepted without many questions. The boss, it turned out, had also taken in his deceased brother's two children some time ago. On her first day, he gave Casey a good payment, and she returned in the evening with gifts. It wasn't enough for a phone, but she could afford a delicious dinner and small treats for everyone. Where's Louis? Erica asked as they all sat down at the table. I don't know. He's probably working late. Casey shrugged. The last thing she wanted to think about was where Louis was. He wasn't making her life any easier, like other husbands. He only created more difficulties. Not only did he contribute nothing to their family budget, but he also took money from the children's allowance. He used to spend money on groceries at least, but in recent months. He bought nothing home except his dirty clothes and complaints about undercooked soup. Casey continued working part time regularly. Within two weeks, she had saved enough to buy her eldest child a new cell phone and some clothes for the younger ones. On that day, Casey saw off the children to school and kindergarten, then received a call on the app and hurried to the office. There, she changed her clothes, and within half an hour. Stood outside a large mansion. Are you from the agency? Come on in. The beautiful girl greeted her confidently. She was stunningly beautiful, as if she lived in beauty parlors. Casey couldn't help but think that if she took better care of herself, she could look just as good. The hostess seemed to be around her age. The house, however, was messy. The girl didn't say another word to Casey and retired to her bedroom. The housekeeper, who lived there permanently, Took care of cleaning, cooking, and laundry, but there was still work to be done. She showed Casey what needed to be cleaned and tied. This time, Casey took a long time to clean up the mess left behind by the wealthy people. When she was almost finished, her gaze fell upon a portrait on the table. She couldn't believe her eyes. Her husband Louis was smiling at her in the picture. Casey took the picture frame in her hands. It can't be. Her first thought was that Louis had another family and was hiding the fact that he was a wealthy heir. Casey shook her head. No, that's definitely not it. The most plausible thought at this point seemed to be that it wasn't him. Maybe just a similar person. Casey looked closely, but they can't be that similar. Otherwise, if it is, it must be a twin brother. Casey continued cleaning, but for the next two hours, she kept thinking about this picture and her husband. If Louis has a twin brother, doesn't that mean Troy has an uncle somewhere? What if he also has children? Maybe Troy's cousin lives in this house. With these thoughts, Casey didn't realize how she had scrubbed the bathroom to a shine. That's enough. Stop it. The elderly housekeeper smiled. I see that you're capable and not afraid of work. From now on, I'll only invite you. Do you mind? Casey smiled. Of course, I'll be glad. That's settled then. 
Casey left her contact information, and as she was leaving, she glanced at the portraits, asking, And who is the man in the photo? The housekeeper pressed her lips together. We're not supposed to talk about our employer, but if you're interested, it's Brenda's new boyfriend, and he, that scoundrel, is already thinking about getting married. Brenda's father, Victor, doesn't like him, and I don't like him either. He is such an insolent person. But Brenda is in love. She's happy. Her father tried to open her eyes, but there was a big quarrel. Casey nodded and, saying goodbye, went back home. Louis was already there, primping himself in front of the mirror. I have a business meeting today at my office. I'll be late, he said. Casey sat on the edge of the bed, remembering when he started disappearing into his office. What's the meeting about? she asked. About trendy toys. I'll buy them cheaper and make a big profit. He smiled. Give me money for a bouquet, eh? A brother and sister will be at the meeting. They have a family business in the toy field, and I want to impress. Casey shook her head distrustfully and pulled out half of what she had earned from her pocket. Louis smiled, took the money, and left. Meanwhile, Casey remembered the address of her husband's office. Looking at her watch, she realized there was still an hour or so before kindergarten. She should have rested, but she couldn't. In the end, she left the house, walked to the bus stop, and got on the bus. Her plan was simple. She decided to tell Louis that he probably had a twin brother in town and look at his reaction. Casey got off the bus at the necessary bus station and looked around pensively. Wondering where to go next. On the side of the shopping centre's entrance, a musician sat. It was a young man who looked like a homeless man, but it was hard to say for sure. Nowadays, young people dress like they're living on the streets. Hi, would you like me to play for you? the stranger asked. Casey smiled modestly. Sorry, I don't have any money. Neither do I, but that's not what I asked, the man replied with a grin. His blue eyes made Casey forget everything for a moment. The stranger was incredibly good looking, with his blonde curly hair and attractive eyes. He seemed young, maybe in his early thirties. The baggy clothes on his skinny body made him look even younger. He cradled a shabby guitar and suddenly started to play Casey's favorite song. The woman was amazed at how well he sang. Why did you choose that particular song? She asked after he had finished. It's just my favorite one, he smiled. You're very talented, Casey said, and looking at her watch, she realized that she had to hurry. She thanked the street musician, said goodbye to him, and continued on her way. When she reached the office, she realized she was afraid to get inside. However, she made an effort and pulled the doorknob. Who are you here to see? came from behind her. It was the guard. This used to be my husband's office, said Casey. This office hasn't been rented for six months, and the cleaning lady uses this room as a utility room, added the security guard. He opened the door, and Casey saw a familiar room, the same wallpaper, the same table and chair with a broken back, only now it was apparently the janitor's private office. Casey thanked the guard and hurried to the bus stop. Her heart was heavy. She didn't take the same route, so she wouldn't run into that cute musician again. She didn't want him to see her upset, in case he wanted to play her something again, and she couldn't even manage a smile. Finally, Casey took the bus and went to the kindergarten. She listened to the teacher's complaints, then took the children home, fed them, met her other kids from school, helped everyone with their clothes, listened to a bunch of stuff about their classmates, teachers and other problems and cleaned up the table. Let me wash the dishes and you go and relax. I will take care of the little ones. You look upset, Erica said. Casey was pleased that the girl had noticed that something was wrong with her. Yes, Erica was like her mother, who caught the slightest changes in her mood, but stayed out of the way and helped as much as she could. That night, Louis did not come home. He wrote a message that he would be late and would not return until the day after tomorrow. He made up a story as if 
his new partners offered to show him their new warehouse in a neighboring state, and he accepted. A stupid lie. With such lying skills, he was never going to be a businessman. Casey couldn't sleep that night. Louis didn't come home until the next day, and again he lied, looking at her straight in the eye. He didn't even ask how their son was doing or how she herself was doing. Louis was absorbed in his own thoughts. Now Casey could see that. This time she decided to follow him. He stayed at home for exactly an hour, ate and went out again. Casey was so worried that she didn't take a new order, but went to catch the cheater in the act. She was disgusted by the thought that he mostly took money from her yesterday for a bouquet for his mistress, which Casey had earned by scrubbing the toilets, probably after him. When she saw Louis enter that very house, she was out of breath from shock. Brenda met him at the threshold and threw herself around his neck. Yes, I don't greet him like that, Casey muttered under her breath and took a quick step forward. The door was unlocked. Casey entered the house and saw Louis and Brenda on a sofa in the luxurious living room. This very couch was the one she cleaned of dirt yesterday. How could you? she blurted out. Louis, seeing her, was taken aback. What do you allow yourself? You're our new cleaning lady, aren't you? Brenda asked firmly, not realizing what was going on. Yes, I am your cleaning lady, and next to you is the cleaning lady's husband. My husband. Legitimate. Brenda, darling, I'm sorry. I'll explain everything to you. Louis tried to justify himself. We have a child together. What kind of person are you that you're meddling in someone else's family? said Casey to Brenda with indignation. Sort it out yourselves, said Brenda, leaving the room. Casey did not hold back, grabbed a vase from the table and threw it at Louis. He had to dodge sharply, and the vase shattered on the tiles. Casey felt like a clown in the circus. Suddenly, all her anger left her, leaving her with only bitter regret. She approached her husband, looked for a moment into his eyes, and then slapped him so hard that he even shrieked. Then she silently turned around and walked away. I'm going to divorce you. You're crazy. You can't control yourself, he said into her back. Casey cried and couldn't stop all the way. At the entrance, she was met by the same neighbor who had helped her with the kids. What's wrong? Come on, I'll give you some chamomile tea. It's soothing. Chamomile relieves inflammation. Valerian can calm down, said Casey, sobbing. Yes, dear, you know everything. Let's go. Ten minutes later, Casey held the tea with chamomile and valerian in her hands, but couldn't calm down, as she recounted what had happened. What are you going to do? asked Mrs. Lancaster, after hearing the whole problem. I'm going to pack my things. I don't want to stay under the same roof with this... The tenants just moved out of Maya's apartment. I was planning to find new ones. We were going to rent it out until the kids grew up. But now, I'll just move in with them. Won't it be hard on the kids? They used to live there with their parents, asked the neighbor. Casey thought for a while. You're right. But I'll redo everything there. I'll buy new wallpaper, as Maya wanted, and then we'll move. Casey took on this plan. She rearranged the furniture, removed the old carpets, and changed the wallpaper in one of the rooms. It took her two days. She didn't stay at home during that time, and the children were at Mrs. Lancaster's. Everything is ready. The things are packed. We can move, Casey said, when she had finished her little repairs. To tell the truth, she was literally exhausted, with no money left. Cleaning had always calmed her down, but the work she had done in the last few days had taken a toll on her body. The next morning, they all moved to the new apartment, but that same evening, Erica called an ambulance for her. Casey felt sick and fainted. At the hospital, she regained consciousness, but the doctors insisted on an additional checkup, and the ultrasound showed something completely unexpected. 
As far as we can see, there's nothing threatening to your pregnancy, but you must take care of yourself. Fainting may be a symptom of overexertion, so you need to think about your health. Casey was shocked. That was the last thing she needed. She already had four children and a husband she only wanted to divorce and never see again. What should she do now? Casey asked the doctor to let her go home, saying she needed to think about it. On the one hand, she wouldn't be able to handle a fifth child mentally, physically, or financially. On the other hand, she would never get rid of the baby. Even if she lived on the streets, she wouldn't hurt the unborn miracle that was part of herself. No matter what Louis did, the children were not to blame. Troy was Casey's happiness. Maya's children had become her own. Casey told Mrs. Lancaster everything over the telephone. Oh, when I was young, I committed such a sin. It was difficult to do it then. After that, I was treated for a long time. And today doctors do everything well, so there will be no health problems later. Are you sure you don't want to do it? Honey, think twice. Casey shook her head, her thin fingers holding her smartphone with a cracked screen near her ear. No, I've decided I'm going to have the baby. That same day, Casey informed the children that they would soon have a baby brother or sister. But you're not our mum, frowned little Julie. Casey smiled. Of course I'm not your native mum, but I love you like family, and you are all equal to me. You are all my children. Then I want a little sister. We'll be playing with dolls together. Julie squealed with joy. No, let it be a boy. I already have enough sisters, Sam replied. Since that conversation, Erica hasn't allowed Casey to carry anything heavier than a glass of tea. She took care of her, as perhaps no one had ever taken care of her before. Casey even wept with emotion, although the hormones were probably to blame. Casey began to work harder. She wanted so much to buy everything for the new baby, a good crib, some toys. Louis refused to help his son Troy and Maya's children, even though he was their official guardian. If it weren't for him, Casey wouldn't have been given three children. I understand that your paternity over Maya's kid is just a formality. I promised you that I wouldn't hold you responsible for them. But you're Troy's father, and I'm pregnant with your child. We need money to pay for daycare and utilities. Pregnant? With my child? That's nonsense. And don't you dare call here again, you extortionist. The child is not mine, do you understand? In fact, Louis was afraid that Casey would ruin his relationship with the wealthy woman, as he had a serious crush on her father's fat wallet. Casey deeply regretted that she had told him about her pregnancy, but she had no other option. She needed money. So, she started taking on three or four orders a day, working tirelessly. After a week of this gruelling schedule, the bleeding started. It happened in the afternoon, when the children were not at home. She lost consciousness on the way to the hospital. When she awakened, the doctors told her the sad truth. Your life is no longer in danger, but you will stay with us for a while. You will still have the ability to have children in the future, but this time, I'm very sorry. These last words pierced Casey's heart like a sharp knife. I lost a child? she exclaimed in horror. Yes, you had a miscarriage due to overexertion. You had internal bleeding, but you were brought to the hospital just in time, the doctor explained. Casey stared at the wall, lost in her thoughts. It was night time, and she had been crying all day and night. Erica visited her every day, until the doctor said she could go home. Don't worry, I've already told everyone that there won't be a baby yet. You don't have to say anything to anyone. Erica expressed her anger. And when Casey confided in her about Louis' cheating, his refusal to help, and his words about the baby, she added, It's all Louis's fault. He is such a jerk. Thank you, Erica. I would have cried if I had to tell them myself. 
They wanted the little brother or sister so badly. It's for the best, Casey. You will have children, but with a normal man, not that traitor. Casey returned home, and the children gathered around her, eager to share their news. Troy climbed into his mother's arms and asked, So the stalk with the baby is delayed? Casey sadly nodded. Yes, it turns out that he wanted to bring the baby to someone else instead of us. They don't have any children, and he said they needed the baby first. They would be happy, and then he would bring him to us. Is that okay? Are you upset? There are so many of us, and some don't have any children at all. Casey improvised her response. No, Mum, I'm not upset. Can you please buy me Lego? Casey sighed. Of course I will. The woman had to start over again. She regained her composure and went back to work. She was hired by other wealthy families and visited them almost every day, doing various tasks. The pay was decent and there were allowances for the children. Casey managed and life went on as usual. One day, Casey encountered the street musician again, the one who played the guitar. He was playing a tune and people were tossing money into his hat. Casey intended to walk past him when he abruptly changed his repertoire and played a familiar melody. Casey stopped realizing that he was playing it for her. Well, hello. He greeted her when she turned around. Hi, I didn't want to bother you, Casey replied. And I've been waiting for you to pass by again. Could I buy you a coffee? The guy suggested. Casey shrugged her shoulders. He appeared rather shabby, but his face was cleanly shaved, and his manners betrayed him as someone who, if not aristocratic, was certainly not a tramp. They sat at a table in an outdoor cafe and talked about music. It felt like magic. Casey didn't know him, but for some reason she wanted to spend time with him, even just half an hour of freedom, to do what she wanted, not what she had to do. His name was Adam, he was funny and shared stories about the street musicians he had met. Casey laughed wholeheartedly. Maybe I'll see you again? he asked. Casey realized that the man didn't quite know the situation he was getting himself into. She sighed. I have four children, Adam. Great! Bring them here tomorrow. I want to meet everyone. And you surprised me. I actually thought you were not even eighteen yet. Casey smiled. You're a flatterer. I will bring them tomorrow, and you will play their favourite song. Any song of their choice. Casey nodded and went about her business. She was smiling that evening, and it made her soul feel a little brighter. The next day, Casey brought all her family to the same place, and Adam greeted them with a smile. He entertained Casey's children and the others by playing their favourite songs and engaging them with musical riddles. It was a lot of fun. Afterwards, he invited Casey and her children to a cafe, treating everyone. Surprisingly, he didn't touch the money earned from his performance, instead using a neat, expensive wallet to pay with a card. Who are you, really? Casey asked, curious. Adam grinned. Me? An undercover agent, he cheerfully replied. Casey shook her head. And seriously? Adam changed the topic of the conversation, leaving her question without an answer. They spent a great time together, and such enjoyable evenings began to occur regularly. Adam and Casey would call and meet up once or twice a week. On one particular day, Casey baked a cake at home and wanted to share it with her new acquaintance. The cake turned out to be delicious, and she was excited to show it off. Where are you? Are you in the same place where you're performing today? She asked. Don't come today. Sorry, I can't talk right now. Adam abruptly ended the call. Casey didn't understand what was wrong. It was almost dark outside, so she decided to quickly give him the pie and leave. As she walked down the street, she heard a familiar tune. He must be performing for someone and wants to earn some money, Casey thought to herself. She approached the source of the music and saw Adam tossing his guitar aside and chasing after a man. 
The man ran, but suddenly stopped and pulled out a knife. They were getting closer to Casey. Adam noticed her, and at that moment, the man stabbed him in the stomach. Casey screamed, dropping the cake. The hooded stranger prepared to strike again, this time targeting Casey. Just as he was about to attack, a deafening gunshot rang out. Casey flinched, and when she opened her eyes, the attacker had fallen. Adam lay on the ground, face down, blood pouring from his wound. Casey composed herself and called an ambulance while covering Adam's wound with her hands. Adam regained consciousness briefly before losing it again. What did he do? Steal your money? What were you chasing him for? Casey asked in desperation. He was getting kids hooked on bad things. I told you I was an undercover agent. It was true, Casey, Adam explained. Casey couldn't believe it. Please don't die, she pleaded, tears streaming down her face. It's not the first time, don't be afraid, I'm going to be okay, he reassured her before losing consciousness once more. At the hospital, Casey identified herself as Adam's girlfriend and was allowed to accompany him. While at the hospital, police officers took her statement, confirming that Adam Foster was an undercover officer who had been working on dismantling the local drug trade. Due to his background in music, he was chosen for this particular mission. Casey mentioned that he had saved her life, and the officer informed her that he was single, with a wink. But at that moment, Casey only cared about Adam. The operation had already been underway for four hours. Suddenly, a thin woman entered the corridor. She approached them hurriedly, and Casey assumed she must be a relative of Adam's, since he wasn't married. "'What's wrong with him?' the stranger asked. Casey looked up and was stunned in shock. "'It was Brenda.' "'You?' Casey said, horrified. Brenda's expression changed. "'I don't care about you. How is Adam? And why did you come here?' Casey stared at her ex-husband's mistress in disbelief. Suddenly, Brenda began crying like a child, her voice trembling. Casey put her arm around her. Calm down, he's in surgery. Sit down, I'll explain everything to you. Casey guided Brenda to a chair in the hospital corridor and proceeded to tell her how she had met Adam and what had transpired since then. And I'm his sister, said Brenda, after Casey's explanations. Adam and my father never got along. Dad, he's in business, and Adam is too honest for that. He likes order and justice. So he joined the police, left home and never took a penny more from our father. But he opened an account, which gave him access to it anyway. I don't know if Adam uses it, and I'm like between two fires. My mum died a year ago. Cancer. Dad was inconsolable. He asked Adam to take over his business, but he wouldn't do it. But in fact, he just wanted his son to come home. Our dad feels lonely. He doesn't know about Adam's injury yet. I haven't told him. If anything happens, I just won't get over it. And neither will Daddy. Casey tried to calm Brenda, and all the anger at her went away. It was the fifth hour of the operation. You forgive me, she said. Louis said that his wife was cheating on him, that she made him to adopt other people's children. He said so many bad things about you. That's why I acted the way I did. Louis loves money, Brenda. I'm sorry, but you won't like what I'm going to say right now. Casey told her how Louis did not like to work, how he didn't want to accept his best friend's children, but he lived on their allowance, and how he asked her for money, for flowers for Brenda. The young woman listened in silence. I had a failed romance before Louis, and then I just lost my head. He surrounded me with care. No, I'm not stupid, and I noticed that he cared about my position. But I was really desperate at that time. The fact that he was married didn't bother me. I mean, he said that you weren't living as husband and wife anymore. Casey shook her head. At the time I made the scandal at your house, I was pregnant. I haven't had a single man in my life except him. 
Brenda rounded her eyes in shock. But we were already preparing for the wedding. He swore he didn't live with you and slept over at a friend's house. Brenda shook her head. My whole life turned upside down today. If my brother doesn't quit this damn job, I'm going to kill him myself. She blurted out and started to cry. He won't, as far as I've gotten to know him, smiled Casey. Yeah, that's for sure. At that moment, the doctor came in and said that the operation had been successful and that if Casey hadn't turned Adam over and clamped the wound, he wouldn't have made it to the hospital. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief. The worst was over, and now they could only wait for Adam to recover. After the conversation with Casey, Brenda immediately ended her relationship with Louis. He started calling Casey and trying to imply that if she didn't accept him back into the family, he would ensure that her children would be taken away from her. Upon learning about this, Brenda called him and told him firmly, If you come near my brother's fiancé again, I'll tell Daddy, and he'll take care of you. Do you understand? You're such a despicable person. Forget about her. Louis was shocked. He knew that Brenda's father had someone who could handle problems in a less pleasant manner. So he promised to leave his ex-wife alone, and Casey never heard about him again. Adam recovered. He didn't return to his father's house, but after that terrible accident, their relationship improved. Casey and Brenda became like real sisters. Brenda certainly was a little eccentric and spoiled, but Casey, alone raising four children, became for her like a standard of kindness and compassion. Casey and Adam's relationship progressed quickly, and when he proposed to her, she couldn't refuse. His father arranged a grand wedding, and a year later, they welcomed twins, two charming girls. <laughs>